This MEB class is dedicated to combustion, which is a very specific type of chemical reaction. And one could argue that it is the most important type of chemical reaction that is known to humankind. So definition-wise, combustion is the rapid oxidation of a fuel to release energy or heat. So you've probably heard of combustion in the context of powering your car. So when you put a gasoline into your car, that is fuel that is being burned or rapidly oxidized in order to release energy that then powers the car. The fuel is a compound that contains carbon, hydrogen, or sulfur, or nitrogen, but usually hydrocarbons. So let's just take a generic example of a hydrocarbon. So let's say we have octane, C8, H18, and oxidation means we are having oxygen is the other reactant, and that is combusting to form. In combustion for a hydrocarbon, the products are always water and CO2. I won't say always, I'll say usually CO2. This is what we call complete combustion. We'll have to talk more about the, the term complete in a moment. All right, so for complete combustion, I am completely oxidizing the carbons. So the one thing you have to watch out for with combustion reactions is that your chemical reaction must be appropriately balanced at the beginning. So the way I do these is uh, I balance the carbons first. So I need eight carbons on the right-hand side. And then I balance the hydrogens. I need nine uh, H2Os, nine water molecules, each containing two hydrogen atoms to match the 18 on the other side. And then I just make the O2 whatever it has to be in order to work out. So eight times two is 16, plus nine is 25. And then uh, because this is O2, I'd say this is 25 over two O2. However, when you have a combustion reaction, you'll typically have an undesired side reaction called incomplete combustion. So this happens in your car as well. And you may be a little bit alarmed when I write this chemical reaction, but instead of total oxidation into CO2, it instead makes carbon monoxide, which you know is a very hazardous uh, chemical for humans. And for this reason in your car, uh, there's a part after the engine called the catalytic converter that is designed to take some of these harmful emissions and convert them into CO2 such that they can't do you any harm. So this is called incomplete combustion. And again, typically when you combust something, uh, you cannot control which one will occur. And it usually is a combination of both. So while complete combustion is preferred and probably happening a majority of the time, you can still have incomplete combustion too. Uh, the only thing you have to remember here is again, you have to uh, completely balance the chemical reaction. So eight COs and nine H2Os and uh, eight and nine is 17. So 17 over two O2s. So when you have complete and incomplete combustion occurring, you must also write the chemical reactions as occurring separately. Do not, for example, write this. This would be improper to write C8H18 plus O2 going to CO2 plus CO plus H2O. I would not even attempt to balance this equation, strike this one out, write separate chemical reactions. All right, so next I have a couple of bullet points that I want to discuss. The first one is how to interpret when the problem says uh, a fuel is completely combusted. There's two meanings to this statement and the, what it actually is could be either one or both and you have to use context clues to figure it out. The first one is in the sense of CO2 is the product. So only CO2 formed in product. And the second interpretation of the statement that a fuel is completely combusted could be that the fractional conversion is 100%. So you can see how you could interpret this statement in both ways. And as I said, you may see this and in the cases where you have uh, either one of these possibilities, the statement could mean either or both. And your task is to use context clues to figure it out. 
the second discussion point is that a combustion problem will almost never tell you what the limiting reactant is. You are supposed to know which reactant would be limiting. So in the case of octane being combusted with O2, pause the video and think which one would make sense to be the limiting reactant, the octane or the oxygen. And if you said the octane, that is the correct answer, but more importantly is why. And that is because the fuel is oftentimes more expensive. So O2 is free in the air. So you don't have to pay for O2 usually. You can just use the air in order to do your combustion. So if you want to figure out which one is going to run out first, you don't want your air to run out first uh, because that's going to be wasteful. If your air is running out first, then you cannot react all of your fuel and derive all the energy that you need from it. So O2 is always limiting for combustion. I'm sorry, uh, the fuel is always limiting. O2 is always in excess. So related to that idea, you may see a process specification say something like, what is the theoretical air or the excess air or the excess O2 or something like that. The theoretical O2 is a quantity that you may need to calculate in order to calculate the other stuff. So theoretical O2 is the moles needed to combust all the fuel that you feed. Moles of O2 needed to combust all the fuel. So for example, if I fed 100 moles of octane to an engine, I would need 25 halves. That's difficult math. Let's see, uh, 12 and a half times 100. 1,250 moles of O2 would be my theoretical O2. Uh, you could also calculate theoretical air because it would never make sense in a combustion reaction to feed pure O2. Once again, because pure O2 costs money. I would have to buy that from a company that separates O2 from the air. And there's nothing stopping me from just using air in the first place, which is free all around me. So this is the amount of air that contains the theoretical O2 that contains theoretical O2. And keep in mind again that air is 79% N2 on a mole basis and 21% O2 on a mole basis. You may see specified that a certain percentage of excess O2 or excess air is fed. And these specifications are going to be completely analogous to excess reactant completely analogous to excess reactant. So for example, if I say that I feed 25% uh, excess O2, that means I fed 25% more uh, than the theoretical O2. Very importantly, when you're calculating how much theoretical or excess O2 you have or uh, working on a process specification, you should not take into account how much fuel actually burns, and you should also assume only complete combustion occurs. So if you look back up here at my balanced chemical reactions, you'll notice that the complete version needs more O2 than the incomplete version. So when I'm calculating how much theoretical O2 I have, I'm multiplying the molar flow rate of octane by 25 over 2, not 17 over 2. I also don't need to know how much octane actually burns. So say only uh, 80 of the 100 moles of octane burn, my theoretical O2 is still 12.5 uh, times 100. It's not 12.5 times just the 80 of the octane that burns. And the last thing I have to tell you before I get to a practice problem is keep in mind that material balances are, are going to be mostly unchanged. You just have to be aware that the outlet streams are going to contain some other stuff. So in the outlet stream, you are going to have some unreacted fuel. You're also going to have some unreacted oxygen. And then never forget about N2, because, unless for some odd reason that the problem statement specifies that you only have pure oxygen um, as your oxidizer. 99% of the time, you're going to have air, which means that you're going to have N2 in both the inlet and the outlet. And you never forget about the N2 when you're doing your balances. That's going to be all for this video. The next video, I have a practice problem ready.